Rob, great to have you back on, my man. Thanks for doing this. Huge honor. I will bring down property values anywhere <laughs> people will let me do it. So thank you. Thanks for coming on. So how did autoimmunity and autoimmune conditions originally come on your radar? Like what got you interested in this aspect of health specifically? Oh man, that's a good, good question. And uh, it was really my struggles. And then my mom uh, first, like she had been sick. I, I mean, as long as I could remember, she had all kinds of GI problems and just a really, um, well, it, it, not infrequently, she was referred to a psychiatrist and that, you know, the doctor, went, well, I think it's all in your head because it's like, this hurts and that doesn't work. And it, it was this kind of miasma of problems. And um, I remember one of the first things that kind of turned the corner for her was finding a, a candida diet approach, which was basically kind of a low carb and it, it eliminated this, that, and the other. And she made some really significant improvements with, with that, at least initially. And, but it wasn't, it, it was probably five, 10 years after that, that we got a diagnosis of celiac, which is an autoimmune, you know, uh, uh, condition, uh, strong genetic predisposition for uh, reactivity to um, the, the gliadin protein in, in gluten, wheat, rye, oats, barley, millet. And it's, it's, it's worth mentioning that for um, not all autoimmune conditions, I don't think for, but for many of them, it, it's interesting when you look at their, their genetics and the uh, kind of the life history, the evolutionary biology of them, they usually confer an advantage in a different situation. So people with, um, with celiac disease have an advantage in fighting off gastrointestinal uh, parasites and, and bacteria and whatnot. So it was a, it's thought to be one of the more prevalent Northern European adaptations to civilization, to living in not hunter gatherer groups, but, you know, farms and eventually cities and whatnot. And there was a, a much higher um, infectious disease load and not infrequently a, a number of autoimmune conditions, you find that the uh, people have a very robust autoimmune response. And so I, I, I know that that's not answering the initial question, but it, it's frustrating to me that many conditions that we face today are, are likely due to an evolutionary mismatch. And only the negative side is mentioned and nobody bothers to mention the positive side that people with autoimmune conditions generally are less likely to develop cancer. That's not always the case. There's some exceptions to it, but there are some kind of benefits there. Some of the downsides is that autoimmune prone people oftentimes also develop more cardiovascular disease. So I, I, I think it's just worth mentioning at the outset that the, it, it's not a 100% a negative scenario. Um, and that's been some of the fascinating stuff that I, I've discovered working through all this stuff over time. But uh, when we discovered my mom had first celiac disease and then lupus, Sjogren's, uh, it just like about eight different interrelated autoimmune conditions. And then for myself, I had what appeared to be the early stages of rheumatoid arthritis. And I definitely also had ulcerative colitis and I have celiac. And so this was around 1998 that I discovered all this stuff. And uh, Lauren Cordain's early paper, uh, Serial Grains, Humanities, Double-Edged Sword, really kind of cracked all this stuff open for me. It was talking about how lots of different plants have uh, anti-predation chemicals in them that can be immunogenic. They can stimulate the immune system in different ways and can be very, very negative, can be uh, precipitators to autoimmune conditions. And an interesting kind of side note along that is once you get past cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease is a massive morbidity, mortality burden. And uh, even in that cardiovascular disease spot, like I kind of alluded earlier, I'm now looking at cardiovascular disease almost as an autoimmune condition. It's like an autoimmune condition of the, the vascular endothelium and whatnot. People forget that cholesterol and lipoproteins play a really important role in the innate immune response. And that is part of what's going on there. And also the, the enhanced vascular uh, inflammation that some folks experience. So I know that was a super long wandering answer to a, a very concise question, but you know, it was definitely um, personal interest and in my, my mom's situation. And I think I really burrowed into it because if uh, if I was able to catch a person's ear who had 
some type of GI problem or autoimmune condition, and I could get them moving in any type of a ancestral way of eating, typically their health improved just to a jaw dropping degree. Like it was really amazing. And still within uh, standard medical circles, like it, you have very poor outcomes for autoimmune conditions and, and really a very um, limited bag of, of treatment options. You know, they have immunosuppressant drugs and there's a little bit of gene therapy that's kind of on the horizon, but um, things generally don't go well for people. The treatments are, are kind of gnarly themselves. Immunosuppressant drugs have a really high uh, cost benefit profile because you could get get sick, the, the flu, COVID, cancer, like all these other things become much more problematic in an immunosuppressed individual. So I think it was almost kind of a, it was definitely a personal interest, but also um, it was like having some really good leverage. I knew that I could, if I could catch folks ear and just get them like, Hey, if you try this for 30 days, it could change your life. And that that's not a really big ask of people. And it can end up being really a, a, a huge benefit to them. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Now you touched on cardiovascular disease as potentially being autoimmune in nature. And instead of listing, you know, all of the things that are, are autoimmune conditions, I feel like it would be easier to go about it in the opposite way in the sense that, do you think that anything that pops up health-wise for people is actually not autoimmune in nature to begin with, or at least has an immune route to some degree or another? That's a, a really good question. And uh, I mean, when you this is where it gets a little bit murky. And like, I tend to be a lumper anyway. Like I like to lump everything together. I'm not much of a splitter other, you, you know, in science there's kind of lumpers and splitters. And at the end of the day, virtually everything is falling under this, this broad term of systemic inflammation and inflammation is mediated by the immune system. So it could be a little bit of a slippery slope because then it's kind of like, okay, everything's inflammation. So how do we deal with that? You know, but it, it, I think it's actually really insightful. And this is some of the, uh, the, the kind of frustrating challenge here. Like you go to a gastroenterologist, if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's or something like that, and the gastroenterologist really focuses on your gut and your poo and everything that's going on. And in, in, in my opinion, not a, a super effective way. And they don't ask you any questions about how you're thinking and what your brain function is. And then you go and, but if you do manage to get a referral, then you go to the neurologist and the neurologist is scanning you for, you know, beta amyloid proteins. And, you know, do we have early Alzheimer's and all this type of stuff? And they never ask the question, well, how's your poo and how's your gut? And, and, um, I've been fiddling with this article for literally the better part of 10 years is basically like the, the end of medical specialties because we, we now, it's almost certain that say like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's appear to possibly be precipitated by changes in the gut microbiota and the loss of intestinal barrier function that then leads into some sort of systemic inflammatory response, possibly a legitimate autoimmune response. And maybe, maybe defining this stuff a little bit better, like in, in autoimmune responses, when your body makes antibodies to different proteins in our, our, our system. And, uh, uh, we want a process like this when we're dealing with infectious disease, we don't want so much of this process when we're dealing with things like allergies or autoimmunity, but it, it's kind of where the, our body is interacting over the course of a lifetime with, with millions of different molecules and proteins. And it has to figure out what is self and what is not self. And if it's not self, how concerning is that? Like, do we need to mount this really uh, potent response to it or is it kind of benign? And you could, you could make the case that the immune system does as much information processing or more than our brain does. It does it in a different way, but it needs to identify the structure of these things, kind of collate it uh, against a list of all the, the kind of known things that are part of our body and are acceptable. And this is where it gets difficult. The different, uh, plant proteins in particular have epitopes of their, their uh, structure. If you think about like Lego being stacked up, like if we had a six amino acid sequence that could be part of a plant protein, but it also looks like the protein in like the tear ducts of our eyes and you get an autoimmune response to that plant protein. Now you might end up with the uh, Sjogren's because your body 
mounts an autoimmune response to that. So there's there's the uh, the innate immune response, which is is not adaptive, and then we have this secondary or adaptive immune response, which is where kind of the autoimmune stuff goes. And it, it's maybe worth mentioning it again. I know I'm bouncing all over the place here, but historically they've really looked at like. Uh, allergy and autoimmunity as very separate things because of the different, you know, classes of the immune system that responds to it. What we're finding is that a lot of stuff kind of exists in this weird middle ground, like uh, uh, mast cell activation syndrome and whatnot. It's not really allergy. It's not really autoimmune, but it generally heightens the immune response across the board because there's something that's going on that the body's not, not digging. And so it, it generally kind of ramps up the kind of like civil response within the, the, the body for lack of a better term and, and, uh, diet, lifestyle, intestinal barrier, dysfunction, uh, sleep patterns, you know, all these things seem to be coming together in kind of a, a perfect storm to irritate all of this system. And I, I think that this is where it's easy for doctors to just kind of dismiss this stuff is that it can affect anything and everything, our cognition, our energy levels, sexual reproduction, um, ability to gain muscle mass or recover from physical activity, depression. I mean, on and on and on, all of the stuff is, is mediated, mediated at some point with these processes. So it, it, uh, it gets, this is where I think that the reductionist approach to medicine kind of runs up against a brick wall, because when you start trying to go one thing after another, after another to, to address it, it's kind of a game of whack-a-mole. You go after one thing and another problem pops up. And I do think that this is the benefit of kind of a ancestral health or like holistic medical approach where we try to take everything into consideration, the total allostatic load, the stress, the gut microbiota, uh, possible immunogenic foods. And we start factoring all that in and just kind of tinkering and experimenting, usually some sort of an elimination diet and looking at, at a general lifestyle, specifically sleep and stress levels seem to be kind of a a very common first intervention to start getting some, some beneficial forward progress on this stuff. So is that where you tend to start then as you start with the diet and then move forward, kind of sleep movement, light exposure, sleep stuff like that. Uh, do you move yep. forward from that place? Yeah. And I try to get all of those going at the same time, it, which is no small ask of, of many folks, but it, uh, and you know, it's funny over the course of time, I've actually shifted my focus to anything that benefits your sleep is the thing that you need to be doing for overall health. And this is true, whether you're like an Olympic caliber athlete or somebody trying to recover from an autoimmune condition. And what's fascinating about that is you do get some pushback on the sleep topic, particularly from like the type A, like, like, uh, you know, corporate exec where they're like, Oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead or whatever. And it's like, well, you know, uh, you can, you can pull out some really cool studies where people that are even mildly sleep deprived, they are as cognitively impaired as somebody who, who has like a, a blood alcohol level of 0.1, you know, like they're, they're, they're impaired enough that they shouldn't be driving. And so you make this case that like, well, if you want to go out and kick ass and take heads in the, the corporate environment, like you should be sleeping more. And here's kind of some support for that. And then people can, oh, okay, we'll kind of warm up to that. And then when you start looking at things like heart rate variability scores and, and a, a few things like that, and their sleep sucks, it's like, well, you're having a lot of blood sugar wackiness. So we need to tighten that up. So we're probably going to have to reduce your carbohydrate level. So coming, coming at the diet secondary to sleep has been interesting because it's, um, it's like, dude, it's your body. Like if your body would just deal with carbs better then I'm, I'm cool, but it, it doesn't. So we need to do this, you know, and maybe, maybe when we get everything else going, you'll, you'll handle this stuff better. So that's been an interesting angle. I definitely like to tackle the sleep, the movement community, uh, gut health, but if you can couch it in something that's kind of, um, non triggering like sleep then it's, it, it, uh, it kind of offloads that, that reactivity to it. And it's interesting, even the, the pushback that people provide, they're like, well, isn't eating more protein bad or whatnot? It's like, dude, you're sleeping better. Let's just sort that out first. And, and then, you know, it, it's been a really interesting process. I wish I had thought about orienting it more around sleep 10 or 15 years ago, instead of really beating the, the dietary drum first. So is that sort of like a lowest hanging fruit approach first? Cause it's like, I find that 
the nutrition, like with autoimmunity, you just can't seem to get around it. Like you could, mm -hmm. um, in, in sort of an alternative universe, it's like, if you could get your sleep on track when your diet is still shit, which you probably can't, but if you could, you right. still have to address the diet. You know what I mean? So yep. that seems to be that, that linchpin because of all this stuff with the gut and the immune system yep. and all of that. So it's like, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one yeah. to, to get as a, as far as implementation goes and practically speaking in everyday people's lives, you know? Yeah, it, it, it is. But it, it, I think you hit a really good point there, which is, um, uh, it, it's just a sneaky way of getting that, that emphasis on there. It's like, you right. have to fix this. Like it's non-negotiable. There's, there's so much good research around poor autoimmune outcomes and like shift workers and sleep deprivation. And even, um, precipitating events being, you know, like really traumatic scenarios where people have powerfully disordered sleep, you know, like they, uh, you see it in like triathletes and, and, uh, some people coming back from, from war and stuff like that, where they'll, they'll end up for a variety of reasons with highly disordered sleep and then develop a full blown autoimmune condition. And so it's still, you, you know, causation is still a little bit murky there, but there's definitely some really tight correlation and it, at a minimum, we find that the, the severity of autoimmune conditions seem to um, track really strongly with poor sleep, like, like shift work is one of these just prime examples, like the healthcare workers that are doing night shift, uh, the, the nurse that, that has MS, um, and they remain on night shift duty, like it, it just destroys them. Like it, it's really a terrible thing. There's far less data currently showing that unwinding all of those poor diet and lifestyle situations that we find ourselves in are as beneficial, but like Terry walls, I think she has eight or eight or nine, uh, uh, you know, clinical trials now showing dietary and lifestyle intervention, showing significant benefit for a variety of autoimmune conditions. Yeah. Very cool. Now, do you think that we're all sort of born with a specific autoimmune condition propensity? So for example, maybe some folks are more likely to experience arthritis and then others more prone to diabetes, another group of people more susceptible to like Hashimoto's or eczema or whatever. Like, do you think that certain, like why do certain people get certain conditions and other people get other conditions? Is it genetic? What do you think is going on there? A, a really good question again. And I, uh, without a doubt, there's some strong genetic predisposition in these situations. So like celiac again, uh, there are certain genes that are associated with up to like a 300% increase in the likelihood of developing celiac disease. But there are people who don't have those genetics, but they get exposed to something like Giardia or C. difficile, which are these really gnarly gut pathogens. And they didn't have the genetic predisposition, but they had an epigenetic change due to a really nasty gut infection that precipitates a, a celiac disease. So they, uh, so this is where, um, I think there was somebody said, I forget who it was that, uh, genetics loads the gun and then the environment pulls the trigger. And, uh, but it, that can go both ways. Uh, people can develop, uh, you know, so like Hashimoto's again, there are certain polymorphisms that are definitely much more highly linked with, with that condition, but there are people without those genetics that, that go on to develop Hashimoto's and, and uh, usually there's some sort of an environmental epigenetic switch that gets flipped that brings them to that state. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Now you sort of touched on this before, but, uh, you know, looking at tying in autoimmunity to things like depression and anxiety, I find that really, really fascinating. And I've kind of been thinking about it um, lately, just noticing it in myself, as well as my clients, like, you know, eating starts to go off the rails, and then, you know, feelings of depression, anxiousness, whatever increase, and chances are sleep and, you know, things like alcohol intake are, are sort of mixed in there. So it's tricky to really parse out. But like, what do you how are you viewing that right now? I did just as far as like kind of the, the uh, mental emotional state as it relates to autoimmune disease. Exactly. Like maybe yeah. some, some inflammatory stuff going on in the brain. For sure. Like what's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Yeah. There? I, I, I think probably gut inflammation, systemic inflammation. And again, this is, um, it's maybe getting trite to even say that because it seems like everybody has some, some degree of this stuff, but it, it also is a little bit, 
insightful that um, less developed areas, and it doesn't need to be eating a paleo diet, but just eating a less westernized diet, not a having so much exposure to say like evening light, like all the the kind of comforts of a, a you know cushy Western uh, existence, which is great in many regards, but ha may have some some you know downside effects also. Um, uh, kids that, that are raised in environments where there's there's minimal evening light exposure, like they, you just don't find the same amounts of, of depression and autoimmune disease and whatnot. But then this is again, where it gets interesting. And like, I have this four pillars of health that I put together for the, my second book, Wired to Eat. It's uh, sleep, food, community, and then movement. And it, it's interesting if you're living in an environment like that, you know, like a pre more pre-industrial type environment or more traditional environment, you typically have friends and family in this extended social network. And we already know that that's like this huge factor in happiness, depression, longevity. Like there's this uh, linkage between inadequate social connectivity being as deleterious to lifespan as a pack a day smoking habit. So that's where this stuff does start getting kind of difficult to to detangle and it, it's just kind of, well, we need all of it. We need community, we need good food. Um, electrical lighting is great, but it can have some downsides like putting some dimmer switches in your house, putting on some blue blockers in the evening. Those things could potentially go a long ways towards mitigating developing this stuff or even managing the, the severity of it if you have it. And there's some pushback around that, but it's also one of these things where I'm kind of like, there doesn't appear to be a huge downside to installing a $50 dimmer switch in your, your, your bedroom and like dial on the lights down at night and stuff like that. Like, I, I, I guess if you bump your head and have a traumatic brain injury and die, then you, you know, that's a problem, but I think that's pretty low <laughs> likelihood in this, this uh, scenario. So, um, I do like the cautionary principle of whenever you do an intervention, being aware of, of, um, unintended consequences, but it's like joining a gym, uh, going to jujitsu, developing community, donating your time in a way that makes you feel good and you have community around you. Um, we don't have perfect randomized control trials on this, but it really seems to benefit folks when they, they do these things, when they tick all those boxes of sleep, better food, community, um, you know, appropriate movement and all of that happens in a really synergistic way. So th this is again, where I, I think the reductionist medical approach is fascinating and it's really powerful, but it also has its limitations. Like how do you then, if you, if you cut the mouse into its constituent parts, how do you put it all back together, you know, and, and same deal with the human being? Yeah, totally. And I wanted to circle back around to what you said about, um, about celiac, the tie between celiac and being more likely to fight off something like a parasite. And we tend mm -hmm. to focus on the negative impacts of the gluten intolerance or the celiac stuff, but not necessarily the evolutionary benefit of yep. being able to fight off um, parasites. Now, is that because of like increased likelihood of transit time? Like, what do you think is going on there that, you know, a lot of people get the flushing effect from eating foods that they don't tolerate very well in mm -hmm. the case of celiac, you know, you have some gluten and you got to run to the toilet kind of thing. Like, right. what do you think is at play? Definitely. I mean, that increased transit time is actually an angle I haven't thought about or, or decreased transit time, like just, or just uh, rather. Uh, yeah. dumping things. Um, I mean, hot foods do that, you know, you eat a really spicy meal and it tends to move things along. Um, the, w what I understand of this currently is for sure there's just the the immune system is a little bit more on edge like it will tend to ramp up a little faster have a little bit more of a caps uh, maybe not catastrophic but um a very frisky response to to a gut pathogen like it, it tends to mobilize a little bit quicker and and more vigorously around that and it, it makes sense from the perspective that if you were living in an environment where um, your water sources could be tainted, you're just around more, more people and there's more potential for the transmission from human to human, but also animal to human. And then, you know, from, from there, then it makes sense that that, that could have been an evolutionary advantage. Um, this is, it, this is one of my, my frustrations. Like when people look at the, the BRCA1 gene family for like breast cancer and, and whatnot, 
nobody mentions that those those women in particular, but it, it, men can have the BRCA1 gene also, they tend to be more fertile. They tend to have fewer health problems earlier in life. Like there's all these other kind of benefits and you don't have to go that far into our, our near history. The BRCA1 wasn't as correlated to breast cancer is what it is now. Like, I think there are environmental triggers that are, are firing that, but the, the, it's only been more the last 20 or 30 years that this divergence from our, our diet and lifestyle is so profound that this thing that was of a benefit is now potentially a, a hindrance. And this is even a more advanced stage. There's this, um, this term, uh, I'm blanking on part of it, but uh, pleiotropy, which makes the argument that uh, there, you could have an advantage early in life that, you know, a genetic setup that then later in life is, is deleterious. The one thing that I would push back on that, though, is that humans are really powerfully selected for a long life. There's this thing called the grandmother hypothesis, which is just basically that the complexity of human culture and the, the uh, energy requirements of raising human children really uh, lend itself to multi-generational families because these grandparents who are potentially post-reproductive age store the wisdom, can, can monitor the kids, can help them, protect them, all the, all the rest of this stuff. And so I, I, I get some of the position around people will say, well, this thing may have been beneficial in youth and not so so great later on, but I still think that there's a weighting towards just an environmental mismatch um, because we have this overarching theme that humans are really powerfully selected for kind of abnormally long uh, lifetimes relative to our, our size. Uh, most primates are, are kind of oriented this way. Elephants are oriented this way. More intelligent organisms that have a, a complex social network tend to be disproportionately selected for longer lifetimes. And, and there's part of that is that you have these, these members of that community that are maybe post-reproductive. They're not going to have more babies, but they can sure help with the, the current crop of babies and like, like adolescents and whatnot, imparting that wisdom and just kind of monitoring and protecting them. So I, I do think that these genetic predispositions are important to look at. Um, they can, they can help inform what we should be doing from a diet and lifestyle perspective, even more so, but it, it's, um, still like, we still just kind of need to do that regardless of what your, what your genetic, you know, deck of cards are, because this circles back again, where not everybody who develops breast cancer has the BRCA1 gene as, as an example, you know? So, I mean, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's these predispositions are, are, they're a probability, you know, they're not a certainty generally. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that too, because it sort of puts the, the ball in our court, right? It's like, okay, well, I might have a specific genetic propensity to something, but if I, I know that if I eat better, I move adequately, I sleep well, get community that I'm going to be less likely for that to happen no right. matter, no matter what. Right. So it just sort of, I like I'm with you at, that I like taking that approach because it's the only power that you have. Like, what are you going right. to do with your genetic makeup? <laughs> right. And, it, you know, I had a person reach out to me recently and they were pretty, pretty cranky with me. They're like, I've been following your stuff for like 10 years, been eating paleo, and I still managed to develop rheumatoid arthritis, you know? And so kind of like, fuck you. <laughs> what is exactly. the, the, the thing? And I, I ping this person back. I'm like, hey, one, I'm really sorry to hear that. But two, um, in your, in your, you know, initial uh, communication, you mentioned that you had basically prediabetes before, and now you don't. And all I would throw out there is that how much worse would your situation be if you were fully diabetic and RA? Like, we know that that's a worse outcome and your situation would be worse. And, um, you know, we're all that we're doing is just trying to risk mitigate across all this. And, and the person actually came back and like, I'm really sorry. That was kind of a prick move, you know, and, and uh, you're right. Because I, I, when I think about how bad I felt without autoimmune disease, but peri-diabetic and overlay both of those, it'd be like, you know, kind of a death sentence type, type thing. So it is worth mentioning, you know, none of these interventions are, are a guarantee. You know, I may keel over tomorrow from a heart attack or something. And I, the, 
challenge that I face is I, even if I have like super high cardiovascular risk potential with the way that I'm eating and living, I don't know what else I would do at this point. Like I've, I've kind of like whittled down, like I do know that I seem to feel best with what I'm doing and too much of a deviation one way or the other. Like if it decreased my cardiovascular disease risk by 10 or 20%, I think it would decrease my life quality by like 30 to 50%. So I don't even know what I would do at this point. You know, we're all going to, going to die from something, but as it stands right now, I've been able to, given the, the genetic and epigenetic bag that I've, I've, I've inherited and developed over my lifetime, I feel like I'm doing the best job I can with it. And that's about all that, that we could do. And like developing some, uh, fatal disease would suck without a doubt. You know, I, I would like to see my kids grow and maybe meet some grandkids and all that type of stuff. But I, I do feel like that it's important to remember that diet and lifestyle isn't a hundred percent fix for any or all of this stuff, but shitty diet and lifestyle will always make the situation worse. Like <laughs> without a doubt. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you have celiac, correct? I do. Yeah. So yeah. how do you, how have you gone about this? I think that'd be super helpful for folks. Like you have an autoimmune condition that you're dealing with and you've done an amazing job of, I don't know how you'd position it, put it into remission or whatever, uh, put it on the back burner at least. So it's not running, yep. running your life, but how have you done that? I, I mean, it, it, it's easy in that I just need to avoid gluten. Now that gets not so easy because um, like we, we just moved to Montana and we found a super cool little restaurant that we like to go to. And, um, for breakfast, I, I order a couple of hamburgers with like a, a little bit of, uh, uh, grilled veggies on it and everything. And, um, somewhere in that mix, they're, 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 they're getting me. Like, I don't know if they're using, I don't know if the hamburgers are grilled on the same grill that they toast the buns. I don't know if they're using the same spatula that they flip the buns over, that they flip my hamburgers over. But the uh, the two times that I've eaten there, I had shockingly decreased transit time um, <laughs> <laughs> immediately after the meal, you know, and I've, I've eaten other places, not experienced that. I, um, I eat at home and I don't experience that. It is cool in that an exposure like that 10 or 15 years ago would have left me feeling horrible for a week. And now it's kind of like an afternoon. So like my health has improved. My, my severity of reaction to a gluten exposure has absolutely improved. I don't pressure test that. Like I don't go out having beer or, or, or you know, a sourdough bread or anything like that. But, but when I get these, these exposures, then I, I, it, you know, it, it's not as bad. So there is hope even there. And I don't know if it's improvement to my gut microbiota or I, my, vitamin D levels are higher. So the immune response isn't so powerful. I'm not sure what it is because I've done all these different things to try to try to get there, but it's definitely improved. Um, but again, mine is kind of easy because I just kind of have to avoid that environmental trigger. And then I'm, I'm pretty good to go. If somebody had rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or something like, so some folks do put that in remission and it may be via some diet and lifestyle modification, like not infrequently, they find that gluten is kind of a, a trigger in that scenario for other people, it's corn for other people, it's dairy. So they may find a really powerful dietary linkage and like, man, so long as I don't have dairy, my joints don't hurt and I'm good to go. Um, but for some folks, you know, it's, it's just, uh, they have to tick all the boxes or sleep has to be really on point. They can exercise, but they can't dig too deep of a hole. Um, or their recovery isn't going to be adequate to, to kind of, you know, motor them through. Um, so mine's honestly been easy and that I'm, I'm okay with complying with the gluten deal. Like the only things that I miss are, are beer and sourdough bread. Like I, <laughs> nothing else really, really, you know, uh, spins my propellers that much, but like, I loved dark beer before, like loved it. And I've tried every gluten-free beer out there and it, it, it's just not, the same. It's, it's not. It's, it, it's yeah, yeah. It's like internet porn versus sleeping with like your 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 the the hottest person you can think <laughs> of. It's just like it's not. It's not it. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, do you think that you've sort of by eating healthfully for years, taking care of sleep, movement, all that good stuff, that you've created a bit more of a 
buffer when you do get a gluten exposure that if you were to reintroduce gluten, for example, on a regular basis, that it would crush you maybe for a little bit longer versus just an afternoon kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I've created a buffer for sure. And the things that I know are better, my general digestive process is better. And interestingly, I eat almost carnivore. Like I, okay. I, I, I've found that, um, and man, I didn't want to end up there. That wasn't, I'm not like the guy that's like, everybody go carnivore, you know, but I, I've slowly just kind of slid that way. Uh, uh, I do okay with fruit. Like I do reasonably well with, with some fruits, um, uh, some vegetables, but like a green salad is not my friend. Like it just doesn't go well. I, it, my wife does a, a dressing that is apple cider vinegar. It, it's equal parts of olive oil, apple, apple cider vinegar, a little bit of garlic, and then a ton of salt. I mean, like a mountain of salt in it. And I'll put that on the salad and mix it up and put it in the refrigerator and let it cook for a couple hours. Like the acid breaks it down. I'll do okay with that. But if I get just like a, a freshly made salad and I, I hammer it down, like I, I will get kind of loose stools and that kind of rapid transit time. Like my gut's not really happy with that, but, um, my gut health has improved. I know when I first was figuring out all of this stuff, I was living in Seattle. I had been in a graduate program for a long time. I had my vitamin D tested then. And I think it was 12, like it was wow. so low and I, <laughs> oh man, it, it, like, it, it's hard to get lower than that. You can, but it, it's really rough, but the past couple of years, I've been using like a, a spurty vitamin D lamp. I get out in the sun whenever I can, and I use this app called D-Minder. So I stay out as long as I can to optimize vitamin D, but not, it's basically like, okay, you're done. Now you're just causing more skin damage relative to, to the amount of vitamin D you get. So I don't really get much of a, a tan off of it a little bit, but, but very, very little. And then I supplement with uh, vitamin um, D3, K2 and vitamin A just from some dropper forms. And I recently had my, my vitamin D checked and it was 84 and wow. like that. And we know that vitamin D plays a huge role in modulating the immune response. Um, there's a, a, uh, latitude based, uh, a tendency for people to develop more autoimmune diseases, the further they get away from the equator. And it, it seems to likely be vitamin D driven or at least light exposure driven. Like that's a piece of it. So I've plugged a lot of holes in that, that regard. Um, I, I get the, the UV radiation vitamin D from either the spurty lamp or being out in the sun. And I do it at a very modest level. Um, I supplement orally with some vitamin D3, K2 and vitamin A because all of those work really synergistically. And then over the course of time, I've really figured out, uh, I've eliminated the, the bulk of the foods that just don't sit well with, well with me from a GI perspective. And I think all of that has bought me much more buffer if and when I do get those occasional kind of, kind of gluten exposures where used to, I would get like kind of neurological response. I would have really disordered sleep for a while. And, and, uh, I mean, it was, it was a pretty big deal. Whereas now I, I feel pretty bad for an afternoon. I don't want to be too, too much further than shuffling distance from a bathroom. But then once I, you know, five, six hours goes by, I'm back to like 85, 90%. The next day, I'm pretty good to go. I think if I had serial exposures day after day for about three days, I would be pretty, pretty messed up. But I fortunately, I've been able to avoid that. Got it. Now, I personally use when I'm uh, in Vancouver and it's still the winter time, I'm fortunate enough that I, I bounce around a fair bit travel wise and get some sun in mm -hmm. the winter time here. But when I am in Vancouver, I will go do a tanning booth. I'll mm -hmm. do, you know, five, six minutes. My skin is, you know, a little bit darker. I'm half Indian, but um, I've noticed that you have done the same. I don't know if you're doing it yep. now, but I just look at it like, it makes me feel better. I think it's better for myself personally than not getting any sun exposure, but there's so much sort of negative connotation around, you know, tanning, tanning in general. So yeah. like, yeah, can you parse that out for us? Yeah. And I'll, I'll be honest, when you look at the, uh, the research on tanning, it's scary. Like it, it's just like increases skin cancer rates. Like there, there's all the stuff and it, it mainly focuses on, um, tanning boots 
but when you, I've really dug into this. And part of this is because I feel so much better doing a tanning booth that I'm like, Same. fuck, I, I really don't want to be killing myself here. So, so folks listening, um, take it with a grain of salt. Like I really desperately want some confirmation bias on this. Like I, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm looking for confirmation bias here. I'm, I'm fishing for it, but. And I'll say too, just on, on my end, like I, I think part of the feel better thing for me is I like the way I look with a little bit more of a tan too. Like that's right. factoring in too. It's like, it is right. what it is, but. but. But this is one of the interesting things when we get exposed to some UV light, part of the secosteroid cascade of producing vitamin D, there's all these different avenues that, that are activated. Our beta endorphins are ramped up. Mm -hmm. You feel better. Like you're like, hi diddly ho neighbor. Like you, you, you just, feel better. It was hilarious living in Seattle where these, these people who are from that area were like, oh, the lack of sun doesn't bother me. And it, it was the days that the sun would come out, like everybody was just spring in their step. And I'm like, you guys are so full of shit. Like you don't even realize how low functioning you are, you are most of the, the time. But, you know, on, on the research stuff uh, around the year 2000, 2001, there was a fascinating, um, review article written that was that made the case that although some amount of sun exposure increases uh, skin cancer risk very marginally but even that has to be taken with a, a, an interesting grain of salt um life lifeguards construction workers people who spend their lives outdoors who get the most sun exposure have the lowest skin cancer rates so there's something not there. There's even something fishy there. And what seems to be really problematic is the pasty, pale office worker that goes to Cabo, lays in the sun, falls asleep from like six margaritas, gets scorched. And then what's interesting, so the skin damage is bad, but this is something that's really interesting. If they then retreat indoors, don't get subsequent sun exposure, that is worse. And this is what appears to be going on here is some sort of epigenetic tuning that basically the sun exposure tells your skin cells, you need to do this, you need to do that, maybe some apoptosis here, that that's, you know, skin cell is becoming weird. So we need to, to get rid of that one. Whereas when you remove the, the sun exposure entirely, it seems to become senescent. It doesn't quite know what it's doing. And this seems to be this really weird track into higher rates of skin cancer. And it, it is so non-linear and kind of counterintuitive. You know, it's like, well, just more sun exposure should be bad. So if I get burned, I shouldn't have more sun exposure. It's like, no, you shouldn't go back out and get burned. But actually the risk profile decreases with like very, you know, minimalistic uh, uh, UV light exposure. And so like getting sun, uh, getting light or UV from the sun is kind of this one chunk of the story. And then when we start unpacking the tanning booth piece, there are some of these booths that are like the high pressure, mainly UVA, which mainly produces the, the tan piece. UVB is what produces more of the vitamin D piece. And these are the more expensive tanning booths that you only stay in for like five minutes. They have like a five minute max or something like that. And then usually in the back of the facility, they have like the kind of disused, you know, kind of look down upon low pressure UVA, UVB bulbs. And those things folks will build up a tolerance to stay in there as long as 20 minutes. And to your point, I think that going in for like somewhere, you know, and ramp up, like you go three days a week, four days a week, and you start off at two minutes and then you go to three minutes and then you go to four minutes and you figure out your own skin type, but you figure out that if you could stay in there 15 minutes before really tanning, then stay in for seven and just hover between that six and seven range. What is really interesting in the, um, the tanning booth research, and I haven't looked at it in about a year, but I mean, I was following it for a long time. I have this giant folder on this stuff. And up until about a year ago, the research on this was use or not use of tanning booths. And that was it. And so if we were to look at smoking versus non-smoking period like that that's an important question to ask but what do they always ask how many packs a day do you smoke and a two pack a day smoker is way different than somebody who has a cigarette when they're out drinking with with friends once a month or something like that technically they're still a smoker technically there's still some sort of risk profile associated with that but it's totally different than the pack a day smoker 
And w- what's 99% of people, 99.9% of people who use tanning booths use it to get a tan. And they usually go for kind of almost the shoe leather type type tan versus <laughs> just kind of like a, a little base level deal there. So I think that, and again, I may be twisting and conflating this stuff 10 ways from Sunday to support the fact that I feel better. And so I'm trying to just psychologically convince myself that there's something okay here. But um, this is an interesting facet of this. Like they're, they're not, the studies that I've looked at up until about a year ago, they do not uh, consider dose at all. How long are people staying in there? What type of tanning booth? It's basically, it's binary. It's use or not use. And we do know that the vast majority of people who use a tanning booth use it to tan versus use it trying to find a minimum effective dose to just feel better and get a little bit of that, that vitamin D boost. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think this is really surprising because so many things in biology work off of that U-shaped curve and nobody knows that better than you do when it comes to, you were on the podcast talking about salt a while back and that's the same sort of deal. So it's not like all or nothing, you know, you don't, you don't want to go for that leather handbag look, but you also don't want zero sun exposure. And I think you know, you touched on the person going to Cabo and getting super red and overdoing it or whatever. And I think for folks to think about, you know, if you go for one really, really, really hard workout twice a year, you are going to be no better off than if you had scaled up appropriately and, you know, consistently exposed yourself um, to that and and ramped up or, or, you know, found a happy medium or whatever. That's not hard to, hard to grasp. And it's the same thing with sun exposure. Yeah. I, I just can't wrap my head around that the the source of all life on our planet is this thing just conspiring <laughs> to kill us, you know? And again, I, I understand that there's trade-offs with everything. So too much or, you know, the wrong, the wrong pattern of exposure and whatnot. The fact that we work indoors so much is a, a major hindrance. It's really hard to overcome that, you know? I mean, it, uh, uh, it's a cloudy day today, but the sun has been out intermittently in, in uh, Kalispell where I live. And even though it's quite far north, I could get some vitamin D if I was out there. And even absent that, I would be getting a, a much more intense um, light exposure to entrain my circadian rhythm. But between mm-hmm. homeschooling the kids and doing the work I've got to do, like I'm not going to get outside until like one o'clock. And that is super not optimal, you know? And and so there's all those um, those things. but because my life isn't optimal doesn't mean the sun is trying to kill me, you know, and, and that that biology is set it up that this, this thing that provides either directly or indirectly, literally all energy for the totality of the planet and, and evolution hasn't prepared me to, to, to deal with that. It's kind of like that, that seems squirrely. Now my current lifestyle, because of the way I live sets me up so that I have to be much more mindful of that because I'm not out morning to night as we shift at the equinox towards ever longer days. And I, I slowly habituate to that. That's an entirely different, different story. Um, and even, uh, gosh, I know this uh, again, bouncing around and kind of out in the, the weeds, but, um, more equatorially living hunter gatherers really avoid noon, noontime daylight. Mm. They just kind of disappear into the, into the underbrush and, and, generally will avoid it because it's very fatiguing and they, they, they can and will get sunburned under certain circumstances. So even those circumstances in uh, pre-industrialized societies, people weren't out in the sun all day, but they were generally outside and their, their sun exposure was going to be kind of intermittent and kind of fractal in nature. And I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So then where does sunscreen fit in for you then? Like, do you throw some sunscreen on your kids kind of thing or like, does it fit in? How do you, how do you approach that? It, it really doesn't other than like if we go to Mexico or the Bahamas or something like that, where there's really significant um, sun exposure, um, the, the, we will let the kids get a first, like particularly like the first couple of days, it's like 15 minutes and then we do a hat and long sleeve clothes. And then we will do a little bit of the zinc based sunscreen on their face, back of their legs, because the kids mm. will build sandcastles and stuff and like the, the, 
we, we kind of screwed that up and they got, they got a little bit of a burn when we went to Costa Rica because we didn't, so we will put some kind of zinc based stuff on the back of their legs, but each day we let the exposure run a little bit longer, a little bit longer. Um, fortunately, Nikki's Italian. So like in both kids kind of got her skin a little bit and I'm 10% native American. Like I actually tan up pretty well once I, I get kind of ramped up to it. So both kids will tan up pretty well. Um, but we just kind of stretch out the exposure a little bit. Um, we use more clothing as the main protection and then we'll go with a hundred percent block out like the zinc in, instead of some of these like paraben based stuff that, that, um, seem to have some, some dodgy potential health, health, you know, side effects to them. Yeah. Love it, man. Now, which, which makes us like Satan incarnate, like every, <laughs> a, a, any pediatrician that listens to this are going to be like, dude, CPS needs to take those kids before the next round of summer, you know? Right, right, right. Now I asked you a whole bunch of, of sort of random questions, whatever, whatever came up post autoimmunity stuff. So we bounced around, but is there anything that you'd sort of want to leave folks with that we didn't get to on this autoimmunity, vitamin D lifestyle, sleep movement, all this stuff sort of topic? Man, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think maybe just appreciating that, um, the details of all this stuff are way more complex than I think anybody realizes. Like 10 years ago, I thought I had cardiovascular disease totally figured out and I just feel dumber and dumber every day that goes by, you know, I, I just have more and more questions and the more I dig into it, like the more ambiguous some elements of it get. But even though the details are really opaque, at least to me, maybe smarter people can figure this stuff out. But I think the what to do is, is reasonably simple. We, we get kind of a protein centric diet. We figure out whether we run better on carbs or fat or kind of a mix. Um, we try to get those mainly from whole food sources, uh, try to get outside as much as you can have meaningful social interactions, um, challenge yourself, like pick new things to do. I just got my brown belt in jujitsu and, and, uh, uh, just ever more in love with that. I'm trying to pick up guitar again and, uh, hopefully Nikki will start teaching me some Italian here. Like I just want to, want to tinker with that language stuff, but just the, the challenge, a little bit of challenge, um, a little bit of new stuff, and then just ticking the boxes of some real basics that if we're playing darts, that's maybe not a bullseye every time, but damn, it's close. Like, and it, it, it's comparatively little effort to get there. And then depending on how complex an individual's situation is, we may need to get very granular to, to get to that next step, you know, like autoimmune paleo or specific carbohydrate diet or, or um, uh, you know, carnivore or something, you know, or some other diet or lifestyle intervention. But for the vast majority of people, that's going to get them very far. So even though there's a ton of detail, a ton of nuance, generally, if we just start with these big picture heuristics, that will get us most of the way there. And a little bit of, of tinkering and shuffling will, will help to get each one of us to our, our sweet spot. Couldn't agree more, man. Now, where can folks find you online, the pod, uh, Element, all that good stuff? Yeah, I'm writing a lot for Elemental Labs for Element, and that's at drinkelement.com. I'm really not online much anymore. Like our, our podcast is kind of it. Uh, I have social media profiles, but I have an assistant that posts them on there. Like the toxicity of those spots just got the better of me finally after like 20 years of being online. And right now I've really pump the brakes on that. So I'm still trying to provide some value there, but the, the, if folks want to talk to me, it's basically a, like your podcast, um, our, our podcast, which is called the healthy rebellion, or we have a community called the healthy rebellion. And if you just search for that, then you can, you can track that down. I would highly recommend the podcast. Uh, I listen to it every single week. I think I've awesome. listened to every episode for like a decade. It's crazy. I look awesome. back. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. So I'll link to all that stuff in the show notes. And thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate hey, it. Thank you. It was super fun. Thank you.